In the news, you see uh, things that make you scratch your head. You see the activities and behaviors of people that make you wonder. And I speak specifically to people that will strap a bomb to their body, walk into a business, a restaurant, or into public, and take their own lives and the lives of as many people as they possibly can. And it's difficult for us to understand why somebody would do such a thing. The reason that they would do something like that is because they have bought into an idea. They have bought into an ideal. And they fully subscribe to it and they believe it. And they believe it so much so they're willing to give their life for it. In 1914, when communism really began to move into our world environment, it was led by an army of no more than 40,000 soldiers. And yet today, the idea of communism affects almost a third of the world's population. Why is it that that has happened over the course of the last century? It's because people have bought into an idea. There's an idealism or an idealistic belief that they have uh, subscribed to, hook, line, and sinker, and they buy into it. I think people want to believe in something. You and I are no different. We want to believe in something bigger than ourselves. We want to attach ourselves to someone greater than ourselves. So people attach themselves to a sports team, to a celebrity, to a leader, because people want to be a part of something bigger than they are. And people will pay whatever the price is in order to follow that idea or that personality. We see it all of the time in front of us. Following Jesus, you understand, has a price as well. Following Jesus has a price. And I think what I appreciate so much about Jesus in the scriptures that we're about to read is that uh, Jesus... He lays out the price for us right up front. He says, if you want to be one of my followers, there's no hidden costs. Let me tell you right up front what this is going to cost you. And so he lays it out there for all of us. And either we accept the price that Jesus offers or we don't. In a few moments, some are going to step into the waters of baptism. We uh, use baptism in the Christian faith is a way of saying that we have bought into the belief and into the man, Jesus Christ, that he's made such a difference in my life, I want to declare to all of the people who witness my life that I am not the person I used to be, I am a new person. That um, I am willing to die for this man, Jesus Christ, and symbolically, we do just that when we step into the waters. Symbolically, we are declaring that there is an old part of us that is now dead and it's buried beneath the surface of the waters. And I'm coming out of the waters a new person, not because of the water, but because of Jesus Christ. And it's because of what he's done. We become fanatics. And the term fan comes from that. And so in a few moments, I'm going to invite not just those who have planned to be baptized, but for anybody in here who is willing to pay the price and make a decision to follow Jesus to do the same today, to step into the waters of baptism. There's a a lot of things that we read in Scripture that Jesus says, and we we love these sayings of Jesus. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever would believe in him wouldn't die an eternal death, but have eternal life. We love that verse. You scarce can watch a football game and somebody's got a banner over the edge of the railing that says John 3.16 on it. We love verses that say things like, um, in this world you'll have many trials, but take heart, I have overcome the world. We, we love a lot of the things that Jesus says. And uh, as I was reading scripture preparing for this message today, I realized Jesus also said some things that are difficult to swallow and understand. And so sometimes even pastors, we, uh, <laughs> we just kind of, gloss over those passages. We don't talk about them. There's one like that in the book of Luke chapter 14. In Luke chapter 14, Jesus is amongst the public. And in uh, verse number 25, it says, while he was there, great crowds accompanied him. 
And because of the great crowds that accompanied him, it motivates what he's about to say. I mean, wherever Jesus went, you understand the, 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 the things that people did to see Jesus. Um, that we, we read stories about people climbing trees to see Jesus. People would tear a hole in the roof to get to Jesus. People would follow him through the crowds to be with Jesus. People went uh, most of a day or a couple of days without much food to be with Jesus. They went to find him at night to be with Jesus. People wanted to be where Jesus was because there was so much surrounding the life of Jesus, the miracles and the hope that Jesus brought. And on this particular day, Luke records that uh, it was because of the crowds that it motivated, I think, Jesus to say what he's about to say. And I think what Jesus is going to say is this, are you willing, uh, are you willing, I know you've broken through the roof to see me and you found me at night to see me and you've climbed trees to see me, but are you really willing to pay the price to be with me? And so he sees the crowd that's there that day. It's an opportunity for him to speak truth. And look what he says in verse 26. You know what, if you, uh, if you want to come and be with me, and if you don't hate your own father and hate your mother and hate your wife and hate your children and your brothers and your sisters, yeah, you even have to hate your own life unless you're willing to do that. You can't be my disciple. <laughs> we, we, we don't like that verse much, do we? I mean, part of it is we don't really understand what he means by hating. I mean, the word hate seems, uh, it seems so contrary to the, the rest of the message of Jesus. Jesus is always about loving people the way you love yourself. So how is it that you could use terminology and verbiage that, that talks about hating our family members and, and hating our spouse and even hating ourselves? How is it you could bring yourself to use words like that? And I don't think we really understand it, so we don't talk about it much in the church. We, uh, we don't talk about it much in our Bible studies, and uh, we maybe would ask the pastor about it, and I don't know if the pastor has always given a, a great answer for that, but we have to understand the word hate here is not contrary to the teaching of Jesus. It's simply a hyperbole. That Jesus draws for us a contrast. By comparison, your family members, your spouse, your children, in comparison with the love that you have for me. You understand that loving me might cost you something in your family. And sometimes I think people who are willing to pay the price, they might hear the word hate from their family member. And it, it goes something like this. This happens all the time in the church. It happens like this. Mom and dad... Uh, have some sort of a relationship with Christ and they want their children to know who Jesus is so they bring him to church. and They bring them to Life Church because Life Church has an amazing group of people gathered together on Sunday mornings. Would you agree? And they send their children down to Pastor Angie in Life Church. They go down to Kids Church and Pastor Angie preaches a message on serving Jesus Christ, giving your heart and Fulfilling the call of God on your life to ministry and missions. And uh, your little boy, your little girl comes to you at seven, eight years old and says, Mom, Dad, I was at the altar today and I feel God calling me to missions. I'm going to be a missionary to China. I'm going to be a missionary to Africa. And our hearts are warmed as mom and dad. We're just so thrilled that our children have heard the call of God. We wear it like a badge of honor. In the certain circles, we're dialoguing with other parents. Well, my child has felt a call to missions. They're going to China. They're going to Africa. They're going to Tanzania specifically. They just feel a call of God. And we're so excited about this because our child is serving God. And we kind of put that call of God on the back burner somewhere as our child goes through the ebbs and flows of childhood and grow up. And one day they uh, start a career and they get married and they start their own family. And again, they have a visitation by God at an altar in a church service. 
and God rekindles that call to that country somewhere else far away from Williston, North Dakota. And they come to you, Grandma and Grandpa, now, and they say, I can't deny it anymore. There's a call of God on my life, and I have to go. Well, what do you mean you have to go? I have to go. I have to obey the call of God. Mom, Dad, don't you remember when I was seven, I was at the altar at church, and I felt the call of God to missions. I got to go. And Mom and Dad, Grandma and Grandpa, look at you, and they say, well, this means you're going to be gone four or five years at a time. And you're taking my grandchildren with you. You must hate me to do something like this. It costs something to follow Jesus. I've seen it on more than one occasion in a marriage where a husband and wife maybe have not served the Lord and one makes the decision to begin serving the Lord. Or maybe both in the married couple are marginal Christians at best. And God begins to stir in the heart of the husband or in the wife. And they begin to grow close in the relationship with God. And the closer they grow in the relationship with God, things in the marriage begin to change. The things that they did together for entertainment are no longer there because priorities have shifted. And the desire of the spouse is now to please Jesus and serve Jesus and be in church with Jesus and serve the people of the church with Jesus. To not do the things that we used to do. And suddenly now there's dissension in the marriage and the spouse who's not serving the Lord says to her husband, says to his wife, you must hate me to live like this. I don't hate you. I just love Jesus above anyone else and I want to be obedient to him. Jesus says it another way in verse 27, whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me, he can't be my disciple either. And we should never mistake the cross for uh, the difficulties that we have in our life, you know. And sometimes we see people who have an infirmity. They, maybe they're bound to a wheelchair or some uh, great disaster has happened in their life. And somebody will make the comment, well, we all have our own crosses to bear. <laughs> Jesus' audience that day when he spoke these words were no strangers to the cross, the cross was a method of, uh, of death that the Romans used. And it wasn't done behind some cold gray walls of a prison unseen by the public. It was very public. In fact, about the time that Jesus spoke these words, there was a man named Spartacus who leads a rebellion with 6,000 soldiers. And Spartacus himself may have been crucified. For sure we know that the 6,000 that followed him were hung on crosses along the Appian Way, the major highway, so that everybody who could walk could see what's going to happen if you rebel against Rome. And there, 6,000 corpses hang on crosses alongside the road. The people who heard Jesus talk about bearing their cross, they knew exactly what he meant. There's a lot that we want, and there's a lot of us that Jesus wants. And Jesus says, it's the stuff that you want that has to die if you want to be my follower. And it's not that you can't have it, but I want to be first. I want to be number one in your life. And it's not about having things, it's about having our hearts. Now, as the listeners of Jesus hadn't quite caught on to everything that he was saying, and I'm sure there was a, a look of shock upon their faces at that point in time, he, he says it another way in verse 28. He says, uh, look, which, which of you who desires to build a tower does not first sit down and, uh, and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? The tower that Jesus was talking about was really just kind of a, a rickety platform that you would build in the corner or at the intersection of some of your fields so that you could stand on this platform and look out over your fields and make sure that uh, nobody was coming to take anything that belonged to you in your fields. And, uh, 
Jesus said before he would even build such a platform, he makes sure that he's got enough money to do it. Verse number 29 says, uh, otherwise, otherwise when he has laid the foundation and it's not able to be finished, all who see it will begin to mock him. And they'll scratch their heads and say, you know, this guy, he started to build. He just, he just couldn't finish. And it's almost as if Jesus is concerned about our reputation. Because he doesn't want us to be the object of mocking. And you understand that if uh, somebody begins this journey but can't complete the journey, it's detrimental to their reputation. You understand that our children are watching us walk out our faith with Jesus. Our co-workers are watching us walk out our faith with Jesus. Our spouse is watching us walk out our watch with Jesus. Our community watches us walk out our faith with Jesus. And uh, somebody might say, man, I just saw such a dramatic change in them. And out of the gates, we're strong and passionate and love God. And we went to the Bible bookstore and got ourselves a Bible. And we started listening to different radio stations. But all too soon, the old way of life starts to creep back in again. And we can't finish what we started. Because sometimes intentions are bigger than our ambitions. Even in Williston, you can drive around our community. You can see houses and foundations that were started but never completed. You can see a business just down the street that was started and still isn't completed. And everybody who drives by, they see the structure is up, but there's no building equipment outside. There's no workers outside. And we wonder, what happened there? We talk about it amongst ourselves. Jesus said people who start the journey but don't finish, well, it's a, it's a lot the same for them. Well, if we didn't understand that illustration, he uses another one. He says, uh, verse 31, well, uh, what about a king if he was going out to encounter another king in war? Will he not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? He says in the next verse, he says, uh, and if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a, a delegation and he asks for terms of peace. Jesus is saying, if this king doesn't count the cost properly, it's going to be a disaster. So he better not start. He better figure out a little different way to approach this thing. Instead of going to war, we'll send out a delegation because I've counted the cost in all of this. And if I don't count the cost, it'll be disastrous. <laughs> Hopefully you've counted the cost in some things in your life. On our wedding day, I scared my wife so badly. Um, in fact, I, was, I knew that she was the one I wanted to marry, but I was scared to even ask. Guys, you were too. <laughs> and uh, on our wedding day, I'm with my groomsman and best man. We're in a little room putting on our tuxedos, and there was a piano in there in the Groomsman happened to be my uncle, who's a phenomenal piano player, and we began to sing worship and praise songs in that room. And the whole time we're worshiping the Lord, I'm thinking about what is about to happen. That I'm about to walk in front of scores of people and uh, make an oath and take a vow to this woman. And I knew the seriousness of marriage to know that when I made that decision, there was no turning back again. There was no break up and find another girlfriend. This, this was forever. And I was overcome with that sense of responsibility. I was counting the cost and just weeping and worshiping and praising God and finding peace and joy in that place. And I come out of the room that we're in, kind of in the back part of the church, and she's out there in her dress, and my eyes are all swollen and red, and I'm wiping tears away from my eyes. And she looked at me with fear, I think, thinking that I had changed my mind but it was quite the opposite. I knew with certainty this is what I was supposed to do. So Jesus says, count the cost. In verse 31, uh, he kind of brings a sub-conclusion to this. He says, therefore, uh, any of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Jesus says, I want to be number one. I don't want anything in your life to compete with me. You can put your trust in yourself. 
or you can trust in me. But love motivated the heart of Jesus to make that statement because Jesus knows that we can't take care of ourselves. And he wants to be the caregiver of our life because he knows what's best for us. So he says, if you know what's good for you, you'll put me first in your life. Is that egotistical? I think Jesus has every right to be. You can do life alone, apart from me, or you can do it with me and depend on him. And I'm telling you, church, not that Christianity is easy, but Christianity affords a hope and a peace that I never found anywhere else. Love motivated him to challenge us to trust him above anything else. Wholehearted devotion to finish what we begin with him. And then the, Jesus has a, kind of a strange conclusion to all of this. He's uh, talked about hating our families. He's talked about um, starting a building project and not finishing. And he's talked about a king going to war. And he's kind of been all over the place. And then he has this conclusion that uh, we, we, we've heard before but maybe never really understood. Look what he says in verse 34. Salt is good. Now, we could pause right there, and some of you would say, amen to that, brother. Give me a chip any day, right? He says, salt is good, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? We have a hard time understanding that. Salt is salt. It's uh, ubiquitous. It's on our counter. It's on our table. It's in our cupboard. It's at the restaurant when we sit down. And to think about taking salt flavor out of salt is a foreign concept to us. But in Jesus' day, they would go down to the Dead Sea. We know that the Dead Sea is dead because of the salinity. The water is four times more salty than seawater. And if you've never tasted seawater, seawater is salty. Around the perimeter of the, the, the Dead Sea, uh, the, where the water kind of foams up and laps against the shore, it leaves behind a, a white crust deposit on top of and in the soil. And in Jesus' day, people would go gather that up. They would go gather that up. There was salt in there, for, for sure there was salt in there, but there was other kinds of minerals and impurities and even some of the soil that was there. And they would bring this back home with them and they would, they would put it in a pile just outside of their house, probably behind their house. And uh, they would use it for different things. They would collect this white crusted soil around the edge. It was impure, it was pale, and some of the salt they would take out to the fields, if the field soil was too acidic, I suppose, they would sprinkle some salt in there because then it would fertilize the ground. Some of the salt was used for preserving their foods in the time. Some of the salt was used to flavor the food that they would eat. But in time, you understand... Uh, the rains would come down and wash, wash over the soil where that salt and the minerals and all those things were found. And in time, the salt would leach out of that. It would still appear white, but uh, it had no saltiness left in it. And so what was left in the pile was really worthless. It was good for nothing. And so they would take it and either throw it in the manure pile or take it out in the street and scatter it there. So Jesus says in verse 35 that uh, that salt is of no use either for the soil or for the manure pile. It's just thrown away. And as hard as it might be to swallow, that's the conclusion Jesus has about people who aren't willing to pay the price to be one of his disciples. People who can't finish the race. People who are just Sunday Christians. People who uh, know how to talk Christian and act Christian, but it's just different when they leave. But when we're all in, but when we're all in, when we're all in and we're fully committed, willing to count the cost and pay the price, we are like salt. Jesus said, salt is good. 
He wants us to be like that salt. When we're willing to go all in with him, he says salt is good. Do you know why salt is good? Because it has a preserving effect. You can influence your coworkers. You can influence your family. That we should influence the world that we live in. Oh, we might think the church is dead and gone, and we look at the laws that are passing around our nation today and go, where did the church go wrong? I'm telling you, if God extracted the flavoring of the salt out of the world right now, the world would be a far worse place than it is on this Sunday morning. We are the salt of the earth. We're like that salt that's good, it adds flavor. It fertilizes. We help to grow life in other people. It preserves. We have an influence on those around us. We are that salt when we're all sold out for Jesus. Would you be just that person today? And then then he's not quite done yet. He has one last statement in this whole dialogue with the crowds that day. Verse 35, he says this. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. In other words, think about this for a while. You need to weigh this out in your heart a little bit. Is it worth following me or not? And you need to sit back and really think this through. Don't begin the journey until you're ready to finish the journey. Don't make some wildly emotional decision to follow Jesus before you think about what it's going to cost you to serve Jesus. When Jesus was finished talking, I'm almost certain if you were there in the crowd that day and heard everything that Jesus just said, there was some in the crowd in that crowd of people that day that looked at each other or maybe said to themselves, seriously? Seriously, you want me to put you ahead of anything else in life? Seriously. And Jesus said, well, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Back in the 1950s, there was four guys that had a burden for a tribe of Indians in Ecuador. They had a call of God. They didn't know what it was going to cost, but they were willing to pay the price. In fact, a movie's been made about their lives. One of those in the group of men, his name was Jim Elliott. Jim Elliott and his three companions went to their death, killed by the native tribe of Indians, in their attempt to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ there. And there's a famous line that has been quoted often, something scribed by Jim Elliott in one of his journals while he was there before his death. And in that journal, he said, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to get what he cannot lose. What Jim Elliott was saying is, uh, I have no problem giving this temporary life to gain an eternal life. If you're ready to lose your life, you will gain eternal life. You'll gain this sense of peace on earth. You'll gain total forgiveness. You'll gain this sense of complete acceptance. You'll gain this unconditional love. I don't know where you are in relationship to Jesus today, but I'm inviting you to the front in just a moment to say yes to Jesus. And if you say yes to Jesus today, either prepared or unprepared for the waters of baptism, I'm telling you, I'm asking you, are you willing today to become the fanatic for Jesus and step into the waters of baptism and let your family know, let your spouse know, let your parents know, let yourself know, let the world around you know, I'm going to pay the price. I started this race with Jesus. I'm going to finish the race with Jesus because there's no greater peace. There's no greater fulfillment. There's no greater anything that anybody can give me. It's Jesus alone to give your life to someone. I want you in just a moment to find your purpose, to find your purpose And when you find your purpose, discover your value. Does it cost a lot to follow Jesus? You'll have to decide. Some would say, yeah, it does cost a lot. And some would say, Pastor, compared to where I've been and what I've done, no, this won't cost a lot.